Welcome to Finding Certainty with your host and U.S. Army veteran, Patrick Lang. Over the next hour, you'll learn from Patrick and his expert guests how to attract more certainty into your business and your life. Now, here is your host, Patrick Lang. Good morning. Welcome to Finding Certainty. We appreciate you coming back. If you're a frequent listener or if you're new to the show, thanks for stopping by. On Finding Certainty, we analyze all the ways in which we can create, develop, and discover greater certainty in our lives and in our occupations, whatever that might be. We work with nonprofits. We work with businesses. We work with individuals in our company, Certainty Management. And here on the show, we dissect the ways in which we're doing so. Today on our show, we have Mr. Rob Jeremiahson. He's one of the co-founders of Scale Up which is the sampler training franchise, I guess you call yep. it, right, right, Rob? Correct. That's here right, in Patrick. Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, thanks for being here, Rob. Really appreciate you taking the time to spend uh, with us this morning. Thank you for having me. Oh, well, always a pleasure, my friend. You know, I always start out the show by sharing two reasons why I've invited this specific guest to be on Finding Certainty. And the first is, I believe especially in business, but really in anything we do in life, having an understanding of effective sales skills is paramount. You might be closing your girlfriend on marrying you. You still need to understand yeah. Yeah. the value of sales. Obviously, their business is focused on, on businesses and corporations that are looking to increase their, their sales numbers. But I believe it's a really critical piece in finding or creating more certainty, more assurance mm -hmm. in our own businesses and lives. And secondly, I'm an enormous fan of the Sandler sales system. I've been, I was a, a sales a trainer for many, many years, incorporated Sandler into much of what we did and what I've done. And uh, there are a lot of different sales methodologies out there, a lot of different sales companies but I believe Sandler is the best, and I speak from experience. We'll get into a little bit of that in the show today. I'll share uh, one, at least one of my uh, experiences mm. as Rob breaks down for us what Sandler is and how it differs from everything else out there. So mm. thanks again for being here, Rob. Yes, great to be here, Patrick. So starting out, why don't we talk a little bit about you? Okay. You're, you're on the hot seat. Uh Tell us a little bit about who is Rob Jeremiah. Where are you from? Maybe a little bit about your, your yeah. upbringing and your family and what brought you to owning this Sandler franchise here in Las Vegas, Nevada. Yeah, right. Okay. Well, let me, I guess I'm a Minnesota native, right? So uh, that's where I was right. born and grew up and, um, you know, long suffering Viking fan. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, I once I finished school, I thought, you know, it's pretty cold in the winter in Minnesota. I'd like warmer climate. So I I moved to California and I was in San Francisco area for a while. I moved to Los Angeles and then I was in um, Austin, Texas for really what was the start of my, I guess you could say my professional career um, back in the later eight, uh, 90s. Um, was got married, uh, had two of my three kids there. Um, and was working for Dell, Dell Technologies, um, and was there for four years. And I, during that time, I had a real interest in, you know, moving overseas. Uh, my wife was, we were interested in exploring, you know, going somewhere else and that sort of thing. And, you know, what I was really interested in, this is around 2000, was somewhere in Asia region was compelling because that's when it was really all happening, that part of the world. That was exciting for me. So I was able to get a opportunity to do that and I but actually based in Sydney Australia to do an age of Pacific role but they needed someone specifically based in Sydney and that was like wow okay that'll work for me and family so we we moved there in 2002 and long story short uh spent 14 of 17 years in Australia with a three-year stint in Singapore um, wow yeah I had a lot of different roles uh at Dell and then eventually moved to a software company, an ERP software company from there. Um, and did a lot of stuff across Australia, New Zealand, Southeast Asia, Asia Pacific and Japan. And that was a tremendous experience and moved back so, to the U. Go ahead. So question for you, Sydney, 
seems just like an incredible city to mm. me. I've got a very good friend who's a movie producer down there. Mm. I, I lived in New Zealand as a child. I've been oh, all right. over the South Pacific, but I've never been to Australia. It's on my bucket list. So, wow. I mean, 14 years there, that must have just been incredible. Yeah, it was great. I mean, I, you know, we became permanent residents and, and stayed in, you know, a long time. We were, at first it was like, you know, two years, but kind of open from there. And it just, you know, ended up staying, getting permanent residency, like I said. And in the middle of that, did a stint in Singapore, which was super exciting as well. But living in Australia was fantastic. I mean, my two oldest kids are in university or one's finishing, one's about halfway through. They're going to school in Australia. I mean, they, my kids basically grew up there and, you know, so. Um, That's home. You know, yeah, exactly. So uh, they're they're in university there, and um, I go back, you know, quite a bit because I have tons of friends there, and as well as you know some kids in school and that sort of stuff there. So it's really been a, a great experience uh, living abroad and and uh, doing those things. I can imagine. So you've you worked in technology for a long time. You said Dell, and then a software I was company. Yeah, and so did a uh, did that, and then also some startup stuff. And when I came back to the U.S. It's with the the software company, and then um, migrated to a, a startup to work with some friends that were I'd worked with many years ago at Dell, and that was in the cyber security space. So, you know, I had done a big multinational company. I'd done a medium sized sort of family owned run business and some startup stuff in technology, which was phenomenal because it's sort of, they're all very different experiences. And that was great. Um, So kind of coming into how I got to where I am now story is, um, so my business partner, David Ooze, um, who I met when I moved to Australia, he was working for Dell in Japan and he was, uh, he'd lived in Japan for, for decades and um, most of the, pretty much most of his uh, professional career to that point. Anyway, so we worked together a bit. Uh, he changed companies. We stayed in touch. We'd meet up in you know different parts of Asia, Singapore, Tokyo, Shanghai, Hong Kong, wherever that type of thing. Stayed friends for all those years. And he moved back to the U.S. a similar time as I did. And and during and then COVID hit, right? And so I was doing that some startup stuff, and that was probably a good thing to be doing during COVID. But it wasn't a permanent thing and he was doing stuff that wasn't what he really wanted to do. And we started talking about, Hey, you know, we want to do something different. And it kind of was like, okay, which treadmill do we want to get back on? Right. We, like I said, we've done well, big multinational, medium size and startup stuff. He'd done the same and weren't really compelled to go do that. So a question. Um, yeah. Were you in sales throughout most of that time? Yeah, uh, project it was always, management operations. What, what were you doing yeah. exactly? Uh, good question. I mean, all of those things were a, a revenue side of the business. So direct sales, managing teams, managing larger teams, regional, um, uh, sub-regional, you know, I had, um, you know, ANZ business or uh, Southeast Asia or Asia Pacific Japan type of stuff. And in the U.S. was uh, sort of a global role for part of that business. And then on the startup side, it was around getting the revenue business going and getting that set up and, you know, starting the the process of generating revenue type of thing. So it was always on that side of the business. Right. So a good precursor to uh, becoming a sales trainer. You know, I've, I look back at my career and I've done the same. I've worked for corporate America and big, you know, major corporations, mid-size mm-hmm. startups. And it, that gives you a unique perspective. I mean, if you've always been a corporate guy with, you know, big Fortune 500 companies, mm-hmm. I think you miss a lot of the intricacies and challenges of a startup, you know, mm-hmm. intricacies of a, mid, uh, of a mid-sized family-owned company. They're all the politics, the dynamics, the technologies, the, the budget, the budget, right? I mean, there's there's a lot of variables between the different types of businesses. And if you have only done one or the other, I think you're missing a big piece of that perspective would would you agree absolutely yeah they were they were all very different experiences um you know and they varying degrees of success or challenge or Mm -hmm. pain or fun right (laughs) Right. so a lot of um, pain (laughs) yeah i mean the pain builds you know thick skin and and like learning right you learn skill set sure right exactly i've had roles that were like a lot of fun and yeah i was successful in them and you know, I was able to do other things after that. And I learned stuff, but the ones that were probably the most challenging, those are the ones you probably, I learned the most, I would probably. Absolutely. 
Yeah. For sure. They definitely make you grow and you have to learn to pivot and adapt mm-hmm. and all those things. So, yeah. Yep. Okay. So you're talking with David, who I've met. Yeah. Very, really great guy. He, uh, he so, and you were looking for maybe a new direction. And did you want to get back on the, the treadmill, right? Did you want to yeah. go back to work for a big company, start your own? You know what? Uh, tell us more about that conversation. Yeah. So, I mean, we were both like, he wanted to do something different. I want to do something different. It was like just during COVID. So it was a really difficult time to um, specifically go into a direction, but it was like a good time to actually pause and like, go, okay, what do we, what do we think? Right. I mean, it was, had it not been COVID, probably we wouldn't have done that. We probably just would go on whatever horse we found that seemed the best one and off we go, which could have been fine and all that. But I think, you know, during that period specifically, we were like, because there wasn't an immediate thing we could, go decide to go do we had to think about it and we kind of came to the realization of, I, well, i'd rather do something myself like we both had about 25 years of professional experience doing the things that i described and his were similar and um so we like we got a lot we've done so let's what could we do well it's a long story short on that as we started looking at what are the things that we might be able to do ourselves meaning our own business right um so evaluated a number of things and and so through that we found we, we found sandler we pretty much discarded everything else we were kind of looking at the point because that was like a standout. This is interesting, better than the other ones we're looking at. And then spent three months of real heavy due diligence on Sandler, uh, the business, what's required, et cetera. And um, I think what certainly sealed the deal for us is the network, as you would appreciate, Patrick, I think is that the network within Sandler, the Sandler businesses around um, the country, North America, and were just fantastic. Uh, they were all open book. They were they would tell you all the good, all the challenge, all the difficulties. Every single person we talked to was very clear on the first year and two are brutal, mm-hmm. right? So there was no sugarcoating stuff. So I can we, imagine. Yeah. So we went in with our eyes open, knowing what we were getting into. Um, and so, yeah, once we, once we decided to go, we, we, you know, we got it going, which was officially in, really July and August of 2022. You know, it's interesting because our stories are are similar in ways, Rob, and but also there's one distinct difference. Um, mm. You know, we started our company in 2019, right? Before the pandemic hit, you know, we, right. built, we built it during this global, uh, you know, shutdown. And it was, that, that, that brought its own set of challenges, right? Mm. The, I think the thing we were missing and the difference between our our startups was that we didn't have that network and that support and right. the you know other franchisees to reach out to. We were creating something from scratch and I it was me all by myself originally and then eventually yeah. I brought on some partners and we brought on affiliates and so forth but yeah you know I would have loved to have that that roadmap I guess you will if you will, where you could be in business mm-hmm. for yourself, but not by yourself. Yeah. That's, that's really valuable. Cause you're not making it up as you go along. Like we have been. Right? Yeah, that's great. Exactly. And we'll spend talk a little bit more you know, about Sandler, but I mean, like you know, the, the, the amazing content is there. Like we didn't have to go and create that. That's the beauty of, of exactly. this, right. The hardest part of course, which, you know, is getting it off the ground, right. You know, it's our, you know, ours, it wasn't, you know, there's nothing given to you. You have to go get it. Uh, but the contents there and, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, yeah. But that yeah, relas- that relationship, you know, we mm-hmm. we've we've established relationships with vendors over the last several years. And and uh, that's been fine. And they're fantastic. And in a very real sense, they're they're the business. side, They're the Sandler side. They already have an existing cost reduction approach or an existing product line. And so I guess there's some similarities there. But yeah. But I I know the fact because I I know other Sandler franchisees. I've got a very good friend named Jeff Schneider up in Portland, mm-hmm. and he he he's talked to me a lot about how they they really help you. They really give you the blueprint. They give you the roadmap. They give you the support and the content and the training. And you know that's and so it's you're not having to reinvent the wheel right? Absolutely. Yeah. Your job is to go out and find customers. They really hand you this business model that has been proven yeah. for decades, right? right. Which yeah, is amazing. No, one, of the, one of the hardest things is 
just forgetting what you think you know or or what would come naturally to you in terms mm -hmm. of just following what is like you said the roadmap so that can be difficult at first right because you're like well that doesn't seem like right so i, I would normally go this direction with this and so mm -hmm. uh i think to be successful not only with the training that you take with sandler but also as a business with it is just following the what works even when it's not natural or right. uh counterintuitive in some ways it's a good right? word for it yeah yeah, it's a proven roadmap. It's a proven template, right? Yeah. And and yeah, I bet you deal with the same thing and you have those same conversations with your customers on a daily basis because much of what Sandler does, which we'll get into maybe after our break here, but mm -hmm. much of his approach and their approach to sales is, is counterintuitive, right? It's non-traditional in a very real sense, which I loved because as mm -hmm. soon as I tried it and figured it out, it was so refreshing and not to mention effective, but, but I bet you have those conversations every day with the clients, right? They so just trust yeah. me, just yeah. tr trust me. This is going to work. Yeah. You do have to get some that are very easily like, okay, let's do this. And others, you know, that maybe have a lot of experience. It's maybe harder to do that. Mm -hmm. And so um, it usually takes, uh, you know, they'll get the a little bit of a grasp on it, but they're only really doing a little bit of it. Right. And so it, once you go through the course longer then that's if they start letting go of that and just accepting i have to be uncomfortable doing these things and then it becomes less uncomfortable and then you get really good at it yeah so you have th you have three children you kind of skipped past your upbringing uh, oh, okay. you have you know do you attribute some of you know what you're doing and how you do it to your family to your your parents yeah. i mean in terms of like what what I've done in career wise, I mean, I think I was always comfortable with, uh, you know, uh, I worked at a very early age at a golf course, you know, at the driving range, picking up golf balls and then migrating up to being in the cleaning golf clubs and then into the pro shop. Right. Where I worked with people and stuff. So I've always been comfortable, I think, as a as a young person interacting with people um, mm -hmm. so that my career path and what I was doing made sense from what I kind of grew up with. Right. And so, um, you know, I'm, I was very much an extrovert as a younger person. I've, I've been a little less of that as, as I've gotten, you know, into my fifties. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it's been a, it's been an interesting journey. I bet. I have a, a partner of mine who just moved from Scottsdale to Eden Prairie, Minnesota to be close okay. to her grandkids. She says, I think we're going to be snowbirds, though. I think we're going to go back yeah. in the winter. <laughs> Believe me, they will. If they're not from there, it won't take, it'll take them one winter to realize they need a second place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but she's excited to be close to her grandbaby. Yeah, no, it's a great so. place. Great place to grow up, for sure. Absolutely. So uh, we're up against our first break. You're listening to Finding Certainty with Patrick Lang and Rob Jeremiahson. He's one of the partners in Scale Up. What's the full name exactly, Rob? Scale Up? Scale Up Advisors. That's right. Yeah. Scale Up Advisors. They do sales and management training here in uh, the Las Vegas, Nevada area. And elsewhere, if you're referred, right? You, you right. really have no limit if someone refers you elsewhere. But right. um, don't go away. We're going to give you a quick minute for our advertisers to look at you and for you to look at them. We'll be right back. Record shop is all clear. Back in two. Thanks, Matt. So we're still recording on the YouTube. I always say right. we get you get the behind the scenes if you That's are right. watching YouTube. So cool. So what? Uh, where'd you go to school? Um, University of North Dakota. It was going to be a pilot originally. It's okay. A, Top aviation school as well so uh that was my yeah my first ambition was to be a pilot i just talked to an athletic director from from und uh -huh. we have a program we're sharing with colleges um can help them raise nil funding oh cool and um so it's a uh it's a, a really interesting approach. NIL, the whole name image likeness movement in college sports is oh, change, right. changing things a lot. And yeah. uh, it's challenging because the colleges can't get too close to it. They have to stay arm's length. They can't negotiate yeah. or you know, negotiate for or pay the students. The mm. donors want to give dollars to the athletes because it 
it gives them an edge. It gives mm -hmm. them, you know, helps in recruiting and retention. Uh, and I, you know, NIL dollars are different than scholarship dollars because they go directly to the student. Mm -hmm. And uh, and yet it's not a write-off. The IRS says that um, it's not a tax deduction. So there's this there's this disconnect. You, and we figured out a solution together with some colleagues of ours where it is a dollar for dollar tax mitigation, mm. potential ROI, dollars can go to the students, the college stays clean. It, it's a perfect solution for any college out there looking for money. Wow. So for for athletes specifically. Yeah. 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 Huh. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it's right. actually sorry to jump in here, but we are just about to come back. All right. Thanks a lot, Matt. Do it. You are listening to Finding Certainty with Patrick Lang. Have a question for Patrick or his guests? Join us on the show at 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Now, back to the show with Patrick. You know, Rob, um, as I was thinking as the uh, prelude was playing, it talks about how I'm, I'm a veteran, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I meet people sometimes are like, wow, your hair is a lot longer than a veteran's usually is. <laughs> I need a yeah. haircut right now. If you're on YouTube watching us, it's like I have this, I was on a call the other day with with three or four other guys and they were all bald as a jaybird, right? They mm -hmm. were, and they were telling me that bald is beautiful. Of course they and were. They were giving me a hard time about my long curly hair that both my grandfathers had full heads of hair. And I said, well, guys, I'll take your word for it, but. I'll keep my hair. I'll keep my hair, right? <laughs> but I, yeah. I, I do need a haircut, it, and it gets curly, as you can see. You know, it's, yeah, it does. I do know. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, you look uh, very nice today, Patrick. Oh, thanks, man. You too, my friend. Okay, so if you just joined us, we're listening to Rob uh, Jeremiahson visiting with him. He's uh he's one of the founders of a unique sales and management training organization named Scale Up Advisors. Um, they are a Sandler franchisee in Las Vegas, Nevada. Mm -hmm. Tell us just in you know 60 seconds, what is yeah. Sandler? What do you do? Let's let's break it down a little bit. Yeah, sure, sure. So scale up advisors, right? We provide and we are what we offer the market is Sandler sales and leadership training, organizational development uh, for companies of really of all sizes, right? And so the, the clients that we work with are, you know, the, they might be they're successful companies in their own right, but they may be looking for some improvement. Um, so they, they may be challenged with a number of things they may have. Um, they might be struggling with uh, their teams aren't very good prospectors or they're uncomfortable in that environment. And the consequence being they're not bringing in new cust new clients, new customers. Um, which is the lifeblood of any successful business, right? Uh, they could be struggling with, you know, their sales cycles go on forever and ever, right? And and their team's spending so much time, and things drag on and drag on, and oftentimes nothing ever comes out the other end of it, right? Um, or they might be concerned about they, you know, keeping their top sales talent, right? Because they they've got you know people coming and going, and they don't want to lose their best people. Sometimes right. that's the reason for why they might work with us. So. Um, you know, Sandler has been really successful at helping uh, sales, uh, salespeople in other areas we'll talk about um, really make the changes to be more successful on a permanent basis. And, and you know, through the reinforcement component that Sandler is really good and effective at and is why so many clients stay with us. So those are it's a, maybe a, a one minute overview of Sandler and what we do. Yeah, that's great. You know, when I was first introduced to Sandler, I, uh, I it resonated with me immediately. I know that some people, maybe it takes a little bit to warm up, but I was, mm -hmm. although David Sandler, who was the founder, is, and he and I are very different personalities. He was this hard-nosed Easterner. I mean, is he from New York or Chicago Baltimore. or Baltimore? Baltimore. So, you know, very direct, very in your face a little bit, very, very, um, I, I think of him as East Coaster, right? It's like a yeah. New Yorker, right? Yeah. So he's from yeah. Baltimore. But but his his philosophy was that he believes 
that every salesperson should have equal business stature with their customers. And his approach was for me, just this breath of fresh air. I, w- I had been in sales for 20 years when I was introduced to Sandler. This was, you know, maybe 15 years ago, right? More, a little more than that, maybe 16, 17 years ago. And it was such a breath of fresh air. And I'm sure you hear that mm-hmm. from a lot of people, right? Do you want to unpack a little bit why I would say that? And if not, I'll add to yeah, it. Yeah, that's a, I mean, I think what you described I and mean, what, what brought, what David Sandler, why he, why there is Sandler training, right? Why there is, is that he was struggling himself in the field of sales. Um, and he thought, there's got to be a better way. He'd done all sorts of training, that sort of stuff. One of the things that he did was work with a, a fairly renowned psychologist in establishing Sandler, because what he wanted to understand is just more of the human interaction, human behavior side of things, right? In terms of why people different people do different things with the same information or the same approach or whatever, and understanding that piece of it. And that was a fundamental part of it and is well embedded within everything Sandler is that piece of it. So I think um, that that's a core element of it. And I think to your point, which is, you know, salespeople maybe historically, uh, whatever, historically or often are, you know, they're, they're, they're hoping that, that the buyer will like me. Right. And then I can right. they'll, they'll buy my stuff or I'll buy my services. And, you know, it's kind of like the groveling salesperson type of thing, hoping for the best outcome. And so, yeah, David Sandler's approach is that's not it at all. I mean, you what you have is of equal or greater value than the person you're working with. So it's just important that you have what we call equal business stature. Right. They have possibly a problem that you can fix. If so, you have you are the expert in this area to deliver that good or service to help that person's issues or problems or make them more successful. Right. Right. And so you need to go in with the right mindset and, but also know how to establish that because that's not an automatic, obviously. Well, I've talked for years with my salespeople about, you know, not all of the Sandler model. I mean, there's a lot that goes into it, but, Mm -hmm. but I have my favorites, right? These these specific approaches, the Sandler submarine, uh-huh. the, the upfront contract, you know, uh-huh. the, the understanding fear uh, in a customer, the Chinese uh, menu, you know, the, these yeah. things that are Sandlerisms, right? I mean, if you, just to help clarify, Sandler mm-hmm. taught a model called the Sandler submarine and he broke the steps of a sale into various compartments. You picture an old submarine, you know, those old war movies like U-571 or something. There's usually a, they take a hit and one compartment is filling up with water and they have to hurry and close the hatch. And there's always mm. one, there's always one guy who gets stuck in there, right? Blah, blah, yeah. blah, 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 you know, you yeah. see him drown yeah. through the porthole and, you know, but he talked about how you have to close these compartments before you move to the next one. But the, I think the one of the most unique things about it is he flips the entire process on its end. Mm-hmm. Talking about establishing business stature, or equal business stature, and this relationship with your customer. He was also very big on not, how did he say it? Not being an unpaid salesperson. Un- not, yeah. Don't, no right? more free consulting, right? Unpaid yeah, yeah. Consulting, yeah. And I love that because I've done a lot of it in 20 yeah, years. Most do, <laughs> most do, most do. So I, yeah, that's great. I mean, Pat, so the, you know, what a, Sandler's law has evolved over the years around that. Like, for example, we're not using the submarine per se anymore, but the same elements and components just in, in, um, in how we go about training those. But I think what a little bit to what you were talking about is, yeah, there's a, a definite process and methodology used, right? And so that, that first piece is around establishing the right type and kind of rapport with someone that you're meeting, let's say for the first time, to get some establishment of relationship and trust, which will then get you to equal business stature, right? So once you have that established, and then that next bit you talked about upfront contracts, which is, man, it is a, one of the most effective, it's almost like a little thing that seems pretty simple, but if you, if you, if you, oh, when, powerful. When, you when you apply it properly, man, it is just, it helps set up what it what it is designed to do is give the salesperson, um, which often they're missing, which is control of a process, a sales engagement, a conversation, mm-hmm. 
without being controlling. So it's not about the salesperson controlling and dominating it to the to the detriment of who you're talking to. It's you having control, but in a way that's uh, uh, mutually beneficial. So you're both working towards the same objective and getting out. What did you need to know? What do you want? What do I want? And at the end of that, we'll make a decision on either yes or no or move forward. If not, no problem. Um, but if we do, here's what the next steps are going to be type of thing. So it's right. super, super effective there. And then the, 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 really the core piece, it is not about how to close better and faster and all that sort of stuff. What it is the, really the most impactful stuff is getting off to the right start, like what I described, but then the qualification piece. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, you know, there's a, in sales, there's a lot of, you know, always be closing sort of thought, like close every time, you you know, as much as you can, often as you can, and, you know, get the sale, get the sale. Um, so sailors are not about, it's all about qualification, always be qualifying, right? Um, and there's three phases to that. You know, quickly, those are, you know, understand what we call pain. What is the problem the prospect that you're working with has, right? And there's a couple elements to that is what they say they have the issue with, but digging in to understand what is the what are the reasons for that problem, and then what is the impact? Because you need to get it to an impact of it's costing me this much, or I'm not getting this much, or I'm you know losing something. Usually, it's dollar terms that are really meaningful, mm -hmm. or it could be if I don't get this fixed, you know, my I'm going to get fired, right? That 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 motivates somebody when it's a big dollar figure or it's a, you know, another element of, of issue, if, you know, then they're motivated to do something. Right. right? Well, speaking of the upfront contract, I want to mm. drill down on that a little bit more because it's my favorite part. One of my favorite parts, right. In the right, whole right. process, because I talk about refreshing, right. And mm. setting yourself apart from your competition or from other salespeople. When you start out with this statement that, you know, the, whole, the reason we're here to see if we're a fit, right? Mm -hmm. See if I like you and you like me, or we like you and you like us. And, and you establish this understanding of what's going to transpire at the end of the appointment, you're going to get a yes or a no. You're ensuring you're speaking to the right person. You discuss the, the budget. You just, but that transition from that upfront contract into pain, you yeah. asking those questions and get them to open up. That's what eliminates all the unpaid consulting, right? First, you determine sure. that they have a need, and then you determine yeah. you're talking to the right person, and and you get, get into the budget. and And the thing that is most different, maybe, about it is that the presentation comes at the end. At the end, yes, correct. Right, yeah. and so you know you're presenting to the right person, saying the right things. You can do it faster. It's more customized. I love that because you know how many presentations I've done in my career. And then I'm kind of closed after I've thrown everything against the wall, hoping something sticks. Something sticks I mean, right, yeah. Sandler's more like a sniper approach than a shotgun approach. And yeah. it's it's very yeah. invigorating. It, it was very invigorating for yeah. me. Yeah. You know, upfront contract, like I said, there's there's the elements are, you know, what are the purpose? What are we here for? How much time do we have? And and when we're good for that. Uh, what is it that you want to get out of today's call, meeting, what have you? Like what's your agenda, right? Here's what I want to get out of it. And I need to ask, I want to ask about ABC. And is it okay if I ask you those questions? And that's important because a lot of times the salesperson goes in and the prospects go, okay, sales rep, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to hammer him with all the questions. I want to get all the information I can from him. And that's when you start doing the tap dance. It's just a tap dance then. So you're saying, okay, we're going to cover these things that you want to hear. Here's what I need to cover. And here's, is it okay if I ask you these questions? All right. And then at the end, uh, outcome. It'll, you know, we'll either decide on A or B um, and we can figure that out at the end. And if there's a next steps, we'll work that out together. So that is very impactful in terms of structuring that conversation and getting the right plan together with them agreeing and an outcome to your point. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but it's important to let the, the other thing is, is to let them know it's okay to say no. In other words, Patrick, if, if we get to the end of this conversation, you don't think I'm the right fit for you. I'm not the right resource for your company. That's okay. Are you are you okay to tell me that? Right. First time they've ever heard that from a salesperson right. in their entire career, right? So it's That's really important to give you the right to tell me that no is a good okay mm -hmm. answer and I'm accepting it. I'll accept that. Conversely, right. I'll, I'll also say, listen, I don't think 
I can help you or fix problems that you might have. I'm going to, I'll tell you that. Is that all right? If I, if I also tell you that. I know it's so refreshing. I, I, I know I keep using that word, but that was the thought that yeah. kept going through my mind. When I was first trained this, we started using it. I was just like, man, this is, this is amazing because you see the customer's walls come down when you take this approach, you know, customers usually have their walls up with salespeople, right? They don't want to be oh, sold. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yet their walls, they didn't just come down. They evaporated in front of my eyes as I started taking this approach. And then I want to talk a little bit more about pain because I think it's a critical piece it is. In, in all of this. But anything more you want to add to upfront contract? No, I think we covered it well. I mean, it sets up your call, your meeting each and every time you're having it because you might have a 10-step, five-step, whatever number of engagements on this sales cycle using it every time in the same mm-hmm. manner get you a much better um, meeting call, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I love it. I, I I mean, as you know, we've talked about my story. I was a uh, sales director for a remodeling firm in Portland, Oregon. And um, I I forget how I was introduced to Sandler, but somehow we came across it and we went to a day of kind of introduction seminar Mm -hmm. and we decided to implement it into our team and i'll talk a little bit later about what happened because it was transformational but let's go back to pain why do you think getting into that customer's pain is so powerful or their fear right their their fear fear of loss is probably the biggest fear for people right but right pain pain and or problem in the presence the most important thing right uh that anyone who wants to address but it, the critical thing is you got to go in with the thought of I need I'm only here to help fix a problem that you have. Like mm-hmm. it's there's there's no value in me coming to you to tell you how great my offering is if I don't even know you even have a problem, much less if I can fix that problem, right? And so absolutely, you and throughout you always have to be you identify that issue and those problems, and then you're talking about those problems only. You're, when you get to presentation, it's only about those problems. But the important thing about that component is is again there's usually there's a sand the rule that says the problem the customer tells you is not the real problem right and so that's usually what we call surface problem right and so you they'll identify that but the real job is understand okay what's causing that so there's a way to go question and dig in to get to those underlying problems and then once you've done that is then working out what is it what does that mean what is the impact to you as a person or and or you as a business, what does that mean, right? And that's because then it becomes an emotional thing rather than just uh, intellectually, I have to fix a problem, right? Because then it's like, oh, I'll think about it. I'll think about fixing this problem. Once it's emotional, that's what that's what triggers the, I am going to do something about the problem. Right. You have to make it uh, personal. You have yeah. to make sure they, they are connecting with it and identifying and you, and that was gotta, a real you, you got to peel me. back the layers, right? You got to peel back the layers of the onion with them. Correct. So. Yep. That that gets you to to action once there's an emotional connection to the problem. Yeah. When we come back, I want to talk a little bit more about pain and fear in sales because mm-hmm. I I believe it understanding it and helping your clients resolve that is uh, one of the most powerful elements in sales i mean i've been in sales for 38 years i so let's talk about that in a minute and i'll share a little bit more about my story we'll keep we're visiting with rob jeremiahson of scale up advisors and we're up against our next and last break so don't go away we'll be right back all right nicely done guys all clear back in about two all right thank you matt good yeah, i could we could talk all day about this stuff. i know right I, at some, I'll probably just, I should we have to talk about it specifically, but just say, you know, there's a leadership component or development sort of stuff for the the management type of thing as well, right? So Yeah, I think so. I, I'd like to understand that better myself mm-hmm. because we never did that side of it. It was all mm-hmm. focused on sales and we worked with Sandra Portland, but, um, you know, I, I think one of the most valuable lessons I ever learned was in sales was understanding fear and pain. Mm. So I do want to talk about that when we come back from break, but 
I also, also it was understanding the power of questions, right? As salespeople, mm. I tell my salespeople this all the time that we forget we have two ears and one mouth. Right, right. right. Yeah. And it, so we, we've got to remember to get the customer talking. The customer will tell you how to sell them. If you just take the time mm. and slow, slow down enough to get them talking, get them opening up. Um, you know, why, why try to guess? They will right. lay it out for you if you take this approach. And Sandra, that's what, one thing Sandra does so well is unpacking that customer's need. Mm. I think better than, than any other sales uh, methodology in my experience. You know, I cut my teeth learning from uh, Tom Hopkins back in the day. I was selling yellow page advertising mm. out, out in the Midwest, driving around, listening to Tom Hopkins tapes on my wow. cassette tapes. <laughs> they weren't eight track tapes, but pretty close, you know, uh, but listening exactly. to cassette tapes, driving around, listening to Tom Hopkins about just basic one-on-one sales, sales techniques. You know, huh. I view that as sales one-on-one and Sandler as sales 301. Yeah. Right? Yeah. All right. Sorry to jump in here, but we are coming back. I stand by. All right. Thank you, sir. You are listening to Finding Certainty with Patrick Lang. Have a question for Patrick or his guests? Join us on the show at 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Now, back to the show with Patrick. Welcome back to Finding Certainty. We're we're glad you're with us on this nice Friday morning. Visiting with Rob Jeremiahson, he's the co-founder of the Sandler franchise here in Las Vegas. Uh, they are a sales trainer. They do leadership development, uh, operations, etc. I do want to get you to tell us a, just a little bit about that side of the business, but sure. let's come back to that in a minute. Here mm -hmm. we were we've been talking about this process of getting the customer to open up, sharing their, mm. their needs and worries and pain, pain as Sandler calls it. Um, I think it's a really critical piece. And for many, many years now, I've talked to my salespeople about the power of understanding their fear and even highlighting that fear. I'm going to put you on the spot uh, here, Rob. What do you think the greatest fear of most customers is? Their greatest fears, uh, you know, could be, it, it usually stems from a lack of trust, right? Uh, oftentimes, I should say, not, uh, comes from a lack of trust. Um, and that they're really uh, not letting the prospective uh, seller or whoever they're, you know, working with, uh, work with them in a way that actually gets to the real problems or or gets the relationship established enough where, you know, there can be the openness, if you will, that that is needed if you're really going to have a effective relationship and, a, and an outcome that's the best it can be, right? Um, so that, that may I, be a part of it. I totally agree. I think um, there's, there's kind of two main hmm. fears I think customers deal with. One is the fear in the relationship with the salesperson. Can the salesperson really help me? Can I trust them to your point? Mm. Are they are they going to be a waste of my time and money, right? Beyond that, though, getting into the customer's pain, in my experience, now we all have fears, right? We have fear of the dark, fear of public speaking, fear of death, right? Mm. Uh, they rank the, t the top fears, most people, I think I heard uh, Jay Leno once say that most people would rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy, you know, <laughs> <laughs> right? right? It's a fear of public speaking, but yeah. but I think it all comes down. It is just gospel according to Patrick, but I believe sure, it sure. all comes down to the fear of the unknown. Mm. And it's one thing that Sandler does really good is it peels back the layers of their fear or their pain and shows them a path so they have certainty. Mm -hmm. There's our finding certainty plug, right? Yeah. So they have certainty, they have clarity in where they can go and how to get there. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Yep, 
Yeah, I, that is a good way to put it. Um, and if the real, if the establishment of trust is there to be able to really dig into the issues, again, more than just the surface level, because normally you'll get a surface level problem. That they, that's what they want to deal with. And, the, and the, usually what salespeople do is they find they hear the first thing, first problem, and they're like, I've been waiting all week for one of these things to come along and just bounce on it. And they're, they're doing the show and tell, right? It's called the show up and throw up, right? And telling them how great their stuff is, usually a feature benefit sort of thing. And that's going to be the answer that they need, right? And then they might progress along and that might close, that deal might close and what have you. But it's kind of surface level engagement, surface level, maybe impact uh, and result for that company or that person. 100%. Yeah. You know, our experience with Sandler was anything but surface, mm -hmm. right? We had our salespeople go attend the presence club, as you call it, as we called it back then. I assume mm -hmm. that's still what it's called, but the, uh, it was very deep, deep running, I guess. Mm -hmm. And yet it wasn't rocket science. It wasn't complex or complicated. There were very simple principles that Sandler just realigns them in a way and repackages them, I guess you could say, in a way that was really easy to learn. It was really easy to to wrap our heads around. Once we got it, though, yeah. sales, our salespeople just loved it. Yeah, the trick, the important thing, and why Sandler is so effective, right, is the the, the way in which it approaches the training itself. I mean, you know, I've been in lots of training and many, you know, you've done, you might be a, a one day, a two day workshop, a five day thing, or, or, you know, once a quarter for a day. And it's a lot of information that you get in a lot of training. And, and it might be the, and it could be the greatest thing that you need and you're all about it, but what happened, no human can absorb that much, that much information and apply it and make it stick. So, you know, a month goes by, two months, three months go by, you're usually hanging on to one of maybe 10 things, right? Um, and that's normal. But what so Sandler does is it's a it's not a quick fix solution. It's a it's a little bit of training over a long period of time. All of our training courses are year long. Many can go two and three years if if the clients want to. Um, but it's around uh, taking a bit of information, you know, in a building block sort of way, uh, as we've kind of talked a little bit about and being able to digest it, how you learn how to apply it, tools that are given to you to use it. And then, you know, it's a weekly or bi-weekly sort of thing over the course of the year. Now it becomes permanent and there's a, there's a real change, right? It's sort mm -hmm. of in your DNA now. Um, and that's what makes it work well. And that's really one of the most effective things about Sandler. That's absolutely right. I, uh, I experienced it, right? Yeah. I, I talked about my, uh, my own experience with Sandler, we, I had never heard of it before. I was introduced to it, went to a one day training. We said, wow, this is interesting. Our general manager decided to send me and, uh, and my assistant sales manager to it. Mm -hmm. So we could come back and train our salespeople. Mm -hmm. We started implementing it and we had them go to president's club as well. And we took that company from, and I've told you this story, Rob, but we took the company for all you listeners out there from three and a half million a year, sorry, excuse me, 3.8 million a year to the next year, 7.5 million. We literally doubled mm. our production to the next year, 15.8 million. <laughs> Again, we doubled it. Yeah. Then we went to 20 million. I mean, you won't keep doubling forever. We were in yeah, a small, small that's market. Yeah, that's but funny. we were literally selling more than number two and number three combined, Chicago and Seattle. We became the number one branch in the country out of mm -hmm. 65 offices nationwide. Yeah. And we were a lot smaller market than some of these places. Like in Portland yeah. compared to Chicago is just, there's no comparison, but we just... Right. We kicked all their butts, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> that's exciting. And, and I should be it all to say. I mean, it wasn't all to say. It was some other things yeah. we did, but definitely on this yeah. on the sales side, they eventually promoted me to be a national sales trainer, and I traveled all over the country teaching offices how mm. to do what we did. And uh, Sandler was part of that. And sorry, you guys didn't get paid for that, but you know, no, the, listen. Uh, it that's okay. That's great. I mean, I think it, it'll give you the uh, process, the methodology, the roadmap, right? Mm -hmm. 
And and what way why you are successful? One is you know you use the training and you applied it and you used it right and you you use the the process the methodology and the roadmap, and you guys killed it right. And so it's it's obviously a two way street that we have the content that we can train and whatever the the learner if you will the client has to do the other end of it obviously for it to be successful. Um, but unquestionably, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's not, but it, it's your point it is not. Like some, you know, you have to have 20 years experience to have any idea how to even listen to this, or it's not complicated. Um, a, a, a very new person just out of school uh, can pick this up and run for sure. You just have to be willing to try it and apply it. Yeah, for sure. You know, um, you know what it did for me as a sales manager and a trainer is it made me confident that I could take any salesperson and make them better. Mm. whether they were a veteran or a rookie. I recruited a guy who worked at a Valvoline store. He was making about 20000 a year as a manager. I said, I promise you, mm. we're straight commission, but I promise you, you can come work for us and you will you'll quit, you'll quadruple what you're making, quintuple it. Mm. And he did. He came to us within a year. He was making six digits. He got to buy a house. He got married. He bought a. He got a dog. You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I remember the day he was leaving, sitting in my office across from the desk from me and the GM, and he was going on his honeymoon, the next day to Cancun. And yeah, he, he literally had tears in his eyes. Rob, thanking oh. us for changing Change his life. Yeah, his life. Right. And yeah. it was a honeymoon that took him three years to actually go on. But he, yeah. That's my uh, probably my favorite Sandler success was him and his story. I've heard that before from you, so that's good. That's great. So, uh, in the last couple of minutes here, yeah, tell us real quick what you do uh, on the leadership side, the uh, leadership yeah. development. Yeah, so the, the sales is kind of the bread and butter, certainly uh, for Sandler. Um, but we also do you know, leadership. There's two other key components: uh, leadership training, which is is for the the manager, the you know, a VP of sales, a CRO, could be the owner of the company, person that's responsible for the revenue of the business, right? And so that's a, a program that really goes into three areas. One is the leadership component, they're, where they're at as a leader, where they need to be, what their gaps are, how to get there. The other is the people side, right? So who are the people they have now? What do they need? How do they find them? How do they proper interview, how do they select, how do they onboard, get them productive and grow them as people within the business. That's the other one. And then the, the third is the actual, you know, the managing and executing of the business, right? So the the, the metrics, the uh, KPIs, the things that we need to set in place and the tools that you need to, to deliver results and grow as you want. Those are the kind of key aspects there. Right. Um, and then there's another program really is organizational excellence, which is more of an end-to-end -end piece of it. So this is, you know, HR, ops, marketing, sales, service, delivery, after sales support, whatever, that kind of full piece of it. And it's designed to say, look, if, if we're, let's say you're a $15 million company, your, your aim is to be 30. There's a lot of things that you don't have that you need. So how do we, how do we logically go about um, managing that growth and growing the business and all the different things we don't have in place that we need in place. And that's usually for an owner, a CEO, a COO type of person that's responsible for more than one silo of a business, right? So that's another uh, area that we work in. And then as a customer cares and new manager type programs as well um, that we do. So that would kind of round out a lot of the portfolio. That is the uh, blueprint, right? As we were yeah. saying, the roadmap. Yeah. Yeah. So how, do, how do people get a hold of you, Rob, if they'd like to learn more? Well, um, as you mentioned, we're based in Las Vegas and our, our business is Nevada based. But we, you know, through um, introductions, referrals, people we know, et cetera, we can do business really anywhere. Or if it's somewhere that we can't really support them on, we have a vast network that I would be able to connect them to if I can, if we can't help them specifically um, due to location or what have you. Um, but you know, they can reach me at my email, uh, which uh, is, do you want me just to give email and phone number, or Patrick, or what's uh, the... Maybe maybe just the website. We can list the rest of it in the description to the show. Right. Um, so if you want to give them that, I think, you know, the, the best way to to reach out uh, for us would be scaleup.sandler.com. So 
S C A L E U P dot Sandler, S A N D L E R dot com. Fantastic. You've been listening to Finding Certainty. Again, if you're a repeat offender, as I say, a repeat customer, we appreciate you coming and spending your morning with us. Uh, Rob, thanks for being here with us. Always a pleasure, my friend. I tell everyone I know about Sandler, I saw it transform our business. I know it can do the same for both small and large organizations out there. Um, If you're seeking more certainty in your sales, reach out to Rob and David at Scale Up Advisors. If you're looking for more certainty in your life, go back and listen to some of our other episodes. There's several examples of how people are doing that, how you can do that. Hope you have a great weekend and thanks for joining us here on Finding Certainty. All right, perfect. Great job, guys. We are all clear. Thank you, Matt. Awesome. Thank Thank you, you, Matt. Thank you. All right. Well, well, that, was a, that was a blast. I really, you got this thing nailed. This is great. <laughs> that was fun. Well, we're still recording. If there's anything we missed, anything you yeah. want to add on to the YouTube, we can yeah, uh, unpack you, it. Did you have a good time? Yeah, you, I, it was fun. And you did a great uh, job of um, uh, sort of, uh, you know, leading through the whole thing. And it was very comfortable, very easy. I, it was obviously helpful. I think you know you're very experienced with Sandler, so that was really really great. Yeah, but, I was and, I was telling my assistant Jill, I said, "Oh, this week, this week's going to be easy." I said, "I don't have to do any research. Yeah, don't have to prepare." I said, "I can, I can get up with no preparation. This will be great because I know yeah, Sandler yeah. really well." But yeah, no, that was great. I appreciate it. I look forward to. Uh, I'll have to put this on LinkedIn and all that sort of stuff, right? So if you want to send me the yeah. whatever. Um, uh, links to the what well, would be best to do the youtube one i guess or do you want it to be the link to your radio show i would do both um you know put it out on your social media put it you're welcome to put it on your website if you'd like it's mm. um i find it's a great credibility piece you know if you have a customer who's um sitting on the fence or maybe considering their budget mm. and so forth and we've talked about you know, some of the ways we can help them actually pay for your service through our cost reduction work, tax credit recovery, and some of the other things we do. But I think you need three things. You need a great offering, which you have. Mm -hmm. They need the funding, which they may or may not have, or we may have to create for them. And you need sometimes a little bit of a push, right? You need a little extra incentive. And Mm -hmm. when, when they hear, um, that it really does work, you know, from a real business or from a real person, not just you saying it because you're right. biased, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Absolutely. Um, I think it can help. So hopefully it does. We, uh, I just know from experience what a difference it it can make. And to your point, they have to implement. It doesn't do you do them any good if you teach it to them and they do nothing with it. But if they will, there is a 100% chance that it's going to change their business. Sure. In my yeah. opinion. I agree. Absolutely. So it's yeah. uh, great to so, chat with you about it again in a little more depth too. Like, yeah, that's what's great about this format. You got an hour to talk about things. Yeah. I really enjoy it. You know, it's uh it's actually something you may uh want to consider. Um I could probably get you an audience with the general manager. Um to create your own show if you want you mean on voice of america is that what you mean yeah voice america it's it's a really great format in fact i was just on a show this week it's a brand new show that we have a host named bonnie d who's done 56 shows over the last 12 years she's done dozens and dozens of shows and she did a new one called uh next at the mic and where she's interviewing hosts both newer hosts and veteran hosts about why they do radio and how it's benefited their business. And it was really fun. She asked me to be on the inaugural show. Cool. You can go, you can go search up next on the mic at, on voice America if you want, but, or I can send you the link, but, mm. but it was a really great conversation. One hour conversation about why radio is such an effective medium and you know what it all came down to? What me and the other two hosts really agreed on is that it comes down to, to relationship. Mm. You know, you don't establish a relationship with customers through TV or magazines or speaking or books or or any of these things the same way you do with a weekly talk show. Mm. Yeah. Because they get to your listeners get to know you 
and how you think and your perspective and they get to see you interact with lots of different guests and yeah and it's a little bit of work but it's uh yeah, the podcast thing is phenomenal like it's just you know there's so many to choose from but once you find one you really you know yeah. it resonates with you you either enjoy or learn from yeah you know, they're really an effective a thing for sure yeah so, you use the you use the, p, you use the p word though. That's a swear word in my book. Well, what is it? Why is that though? Because you, you know, <laughs> there's a difference. Path, this right? is a yeah. This is a this is a live radio show uh -huh. that goes out. There are literally Voice America has millions of listeners around the world, right? Mm -hmm. So the difference is is that this is live. It's a live radio format. Mm -hmm. It then is once it's done and you'll and you'll see this once it's done it, it's uploaded to all of the podcast channels so it goes on apple and google mm -hmm. and yeah that's i heart radio that. and so yeah. forth so on but but i i think if a podcast is different because it's typically pre-recorded mm -hmm. and then uploaded and played so this is live we can't screw yeah. up right we yeah that's edit. right yeah we no can't error ed ed edit it as we're going yeah <laughs> like 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 a lot of podcasts do you know they yeah, of course. That's you can, probably you can the biggest that difference. Thing. But yeah, no, it's great. You've done a great job with it. I've, you know, I've seen a number of your episodes, and it's uh, it's good. It's you're, fun. Uh, you're good at it, man. You're really good at it. Thanks, so. man. I've had, I've really enjoyed it. I highly recommend it. If you yeah, have any, I would, any interest, I think, I'd be happy to. I, seriously, it's a good meeting. format to to do what you know. Will you talk about it? And I guess you know you have a guest and. Mm -hmm. whatever you know it's like I mean, you and i could do one and you talk about your experience or or whatever i'd love I mean, to yeah. yeah i mean it i think with you um from a if you were to become a host mm -hmm. voice america is great because they they do all the sound engineering they do all the social media they they you don't have to do a lot other than show up and do your hour and then your hour right. it takes some prep time but yeah um but I think because you do so many things for businesses between the sales and the leadership development and the, mm. you know, the customer path, all the, all these different things you do, you could bring on a lot of different guests, both prospective customers, existing customers. I mean, you could reach out to any Sandler customer, any Sandler franchisee nationwide and say, so who's, one your, who's one of your customers I could have in your interview on my show. You'd have an unlimited number of, True, yeah. Perspective, yes. But you could analyze Sandler from their perspective and their experience in a number of different ways. And it's it's you know, powerful that... and it gives you instant credibility. Huh. It gives yeah. you a bigger reach. It gives you, I think, um press pass, which is nice, but you give um yeah, there's a lot to it. I think I I don't yeah. always say this to people, but I think you would be actually a really good a really good host well it's something that yeah i would definitely it's probably a good it's a real good format to think about for 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 me and the business right and so i'll I'll look into it i think because yeah. you know I, you're right there's a lot of the network offers a lot of for sure to bring to the table on it right so yeah good yeah. all right let me let's all right it. my friend well I'll, I'll, uh, I'm happy to make an introduction if you want. I, I, yeah. I mean, or whatever is, I don't you know what it, what it takes to get started and what it looks like, or he got to talk to. And I'd be happy to look at that because now that you mention it, it's worth, it's definitely worth looking at. I've, I have absolutely loved it and you have to show up every week, right? You have to, I mean, it's, I've had a couple of times where I was going to be out of town on that Friday. It wasn't going to work. So we just pre-record the show and we record it. Like I'm going to be gone three weeks in December and I'm pre-recording the shows to have them ready to play. Uh, Cause we'll be overseas, but the uh, headed toward Australia, not quite. We're going to Fiji, <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, and then back a week in Hawaii, but, um, but it's, it's fun. It is a lot of fun. And you, you get to control the message and you get to, you know, even though your interview is focused on the guests, you still get to educate people a little bit on, you know, in your case, you'd educate people a lot on what you do and how you do it. And uh, so it'd be great. So, yeah, I'd love to eat it another time, but you can tell, I need to understand. I wanted to know you grew up a bit or the New Zealand thing, but how you never made it to Australia living in New Zealand, I don't understand. So you'll have well, to. I, 
well, I was five, so I didn't have a lot of say you about it. You didn't have any control over it. I appreciate that. <laughs> I give my dad a hard time because he's been there many times. He was in charge of all the microfilming um, for the South Pacific for the Family History Library in Salt Lake City. So he'd meet with archivists and the king of Samoa, you know, and all oh, these wow. different things, getting permission to microfilm their family records, right? You know, the Salt Lake City, the LDS Church has one of the largest genealogical libraries in the world. I think it may, I think it is the largest. They have archives yeah. built back into the mountain that keep the microfilm, the original film, from getting too hot, right? It's nice yeah. and cold. And so so he, that was his job. So he traveled all over the South Pacific. I've been to all the islands except for wow. I never, never went to Australia. You never went to the biggest island, right? Yeah. <laughs> Someday. I've yeah, been invited I, many times. I have a my a good friend down there, and and I've always wanted to. So we'll, we'll get there eventually. Where are you going in December? Uh, we're going to Fiji. We'll be there for a week and a half, and then coming back, we're going to be in Kauai for about a wow. week and a half. Well, that's that is going to be magnificent. Three weeks. Yeah, it should be fun. I uh, I met my wife. Um, I used to work for a timeshare company, a vacation ownership company called mm. Worldmark, uh, Worldmark, the club. It's now owned by Wyndham. Mm. And I was a salesperson there many, many years ago. And I sold my wife on buying our package, our vacation ownership package. She was a guest when she walked in. That's how we met. She was my toughest customer. It took her about eight hours to make a decision. But to this day, I told her, and I was just talking to my mom about this the other day. I said, I promised her that if she bought it, she would go on vacations the rest of her life. It would force her to go somewhere every year, every year, or every year or two. Because when you invest the money and you're paying dues every year, you don't want it to go to waste, right? And so you you just plan accordingly. So we we use it every year. We go different places. It's not just a week somewhere. We have points that we can spend in you know, dozens of locations. But, but so it's true. It was a true statement. You know, she bought it. I sold and brought her. you with it. She didn't know that, and she didn't know that. But I took her to dinner after her and her friend, and uh, and uh, the rest is history. So, <laughs> well, congrats. Good story. So, so that's the reason we're going because we just don't want to go to waste, and so we end up making it a priority. And um, cool. so both actually, in Hawaii are are using your your point stuff, whatever. We are, yeah, and we're, cool. we're taking my, we're taking my boys. They're meeting us in Ho for the last part of Hawaii, so they'll be there for about a week. And great, my uh, seventeen year old and nineteen year old are going to fly over and and meet us. So they've never been to Hawaii, so they're excited. I bet uh, they are. I bet they are. Yeah, good news. All right. Well, listen. All right, I'll my friend. Talk soon. Okay. Okay. Thanks for being on the show. If you're listening to the YouTube here, thanks for listening yep. listening to us ramble a little bit here. But uh, you get the back, you get the behind the scenes, and you listen to the YouTube. So, um, we'll keep talking, my friend. I I need to get okay. you some more uh, some more of those leads. I've just been busy, but I uh, I have some I more people I want to refer to you. So, Please. yeah, when you can, that'd be great. Um, and uh, yeah, cool. And I look forward get a link to this stuff i will today it, or it, when would it be it, available? it'll take us a day or two to have the youtube ready but then we'll i'll send it all over to you and um okay I, and voice america actually remasters the soundtrack so it's going to be really good it, okay the sound on that will always be better than the youtube but it's nice to have both some people yeah no it'd be great because i've got actually the music well. for I've, I've got someone wanting some video thing of me because i'm gonna i might be presenting at a one of the uh, conference thing in Vegas oh. is coming up for uh yeah uh, in, in an industry thing and so they're like yeah do you got any footage of something and so I've got one that's not that great but this uh -huh. would be good for them to see as well so that's good you know I I uh I saw on your website the other day you and Dave were highlighted in what is it what was the name of the magazine that's right there on the front of the of the website um Right on the front. Well, we have a on the website. There's the ribbon cutting event that you were at, right? Um, our website. I'm trying to think what you're talking about. I don't know. I think that I don't know of a on our website or some other one. I thought it was yours. Um, 
Just trying maybe to think. A, maybe it was maybe somewhere else. Like we've, we've got, unless our marketing person put something new up there, I'm not sure. So yeah, the ribbon cutting event at the chambers there, the, the how effective is Sandler, the, 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 the testimonial video that you are also in is there. Yeah. Um, magazine. Where did I find that? Anyway, check it out. It was, uh, it was pretty it's a pretty prestigious magazine. You just get too much press, you forget about them all. Well, yeah, I'd like to they know. They all blend true. together, right? <laughs> I wish that were true. Okay. <laughs> good, Patrick. I appreciate it. All right, bud. Talk soon. Okay. Have a good weekend. You too. Bye. We'll see you. Thanks for listening, guys. Have a great weekend yourself. Let us know if we can do anything to help you create more certainty in your life here at Certainty Management. We uh, we help our clients to improve their profitability in a dozen different ways. Uh, we can help you make more and keep more. And uh, if you're interested in learning more about how we do that, visit us on the web at certaintyteam.com. Text the word certainty to 26786 or reach out to us. You'll see our contact information in the description below. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you later.